This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2021. Lesson 5 from the series Rest in Christ is titled Come to Me. It's ready for teaching on July 31 and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 24. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We always like to thank you for your word because it's the source not only of inspiration but of our salvation as we find the lovely Jesus, as we find his creatorship. We also find the salvation that is provided as we also find the future for each of us. But in this week's lesson, we're going to find about how there is peace, there is rest, there is comfort in knowing Jesus and being able to come to him. And wherever we are in the world, dear Heavenly Father, whether it be at the tip of South America, whether it be in Alaska, whether it be in Peking or Beijing, as it's called now, uh, whether it's in London or South Africa, We pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us, that we may know that not only is Jesus the one who comforts and guides us, but he is the one that we can trust with our lives. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's Matthew 11:28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What a wonderful promise we have been given here by Jesus. After all, who among us at times hasn't felt heavy laden, if not so much with work itself, though that can often be the case, but with the labor and heavy ladenness that life itself brings? And Jesus here is telling us that, yes, he knows what we are going through, and yes, he can help us, that is, if we let him. And then, after telling us to bear his yoke, Jesus says in Matthew 11.30, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, get rid of the yokes and burdens that you are carrying, give them to me, and take mine upon yourself instead, for mine are easier to bear. How can we experience the rest that Jesus is talking about? After all, we live in a world where after sin, the Lord said to Adam, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, in Genesis 3.19. Thus, we have known what it is like to labour and to be carrying burdens that can seem too hard to bear, at least by ourselves. Sunday, July 25. I will give you rest. Question. Read Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 to 28, where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What is the context of this statement? How does Jesus give this rest? Matthew 11, beginning at verse 20. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, It will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who were exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. 
At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. As all of us, Jesus never spoke without a context. In order to understand him, we need to grasp the specific context surrounding a particular statement, especially if we want to avoid misinterpreting Jesus. Matthew 11 marks a turning point in Matthew's Gospel. The statements denouncing important Galilean cities are the harshest heard so far in the Gospel. Jesus does not curry favours. He puts the finger where it hurts. He associates with the wrong people. As we read in Matthew 9, 9-13, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. His claim to be able to forgive sins is scandalous in the eyes of the religious leaders, as we read in the preceding verses, verses 1 to 8 of chapter 9. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Then, behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. Now when the multitude saw it, they marvelled and glorified God, who had given such power to men. Indeed, Jesus speaks some powerfully condemning words to the people, even comparing them unfavourably to Sodom, viewed then as today as a place of implacable wickedness. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you in Matthew 11.24. Tensions are rising, and yet, in the midst of all of this, Jesus changes gear and offers true rest. He can do so because all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, Matthew 11.27. Jesus' ability to give rest is based on his divinity and his oneness with the Father. Before we can come to unload our burdens, we need to understand that we cannot carry them alone. In fact, most of us will not come unless we have recognised our true condition. Jesus' invitation is need-based. His statement in Matthew 11.28 begins with an imperative in the Greek original, come is not optional. Come represents the precondition of finding rest. Come means that we need to surrender control. In a time when we can conveniently control many things in our lives via our smartphones, coming to Jesus is not a natural direction. In fact, for most people, surrender is the toughest part of the Christian life. We love to talk, and rightly so, about all that God does for us in Christ and how we cannot save ourselves and the like. All that is true, 
But in the end, we still have to make the conscious choice to come to Jesus, which means surrender to him. Here is where the reality of free will becomes front and centre in the Christian life. And so to finish today, what burdens are you carrying? How can you learn to give them to Jesus and experience the rest he offers at so great a cost to himself? Monday, July 26. Take my yoke upon you. Question. Read Matthew 11, verses 29 and 30. Why does Jesus command us to take his yoke right after he has invited us to give him our burdens and find true rest? Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. After the first imperative, come, in Matthew 11.28, two more imperatives follow in Matthew 11.29. Take and learn, focus the attention of the audience and the reader on Jesus. We are to take his yoke and learn from him. The intimate relationship in the Godhead between the Father and the Son, already intimated in Matthew 11, 25-27, offers a powerful illustration that may explain the yoke metaphor in these verses. Matthew 11, 25-27. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Both the Father and the Son are working unitedly to save humanity. While the yoke is a symbol of submission, as we see in Jeremiah 27, it also is a metaphor illustrating united purpose. In Jeremiah chapter 27, uh, the title of the chapter here is Symbol of the Bonds and Yokes. And it starts off, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord to me, Make for yourselves bonds and yokes, and put them on your neck, and send them to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of the Ammonites, the king of Tyre, and the king of Sire, by the hand of the messengers, who come to Jerusalem, to Zedekiah, king of Judah." And command them to say to their masters, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus you shall say to your masters, I have made the earth, the man, and the beast that are on the ground, by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and have given it to whom it seemed proper to me. And now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and the beasts of the field I have also given him to serve him. And then it continues on, and uh, in verse 8 we read, And it shall be that the nation and kingdom which will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and which will not put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation I will punish, says the Lord, with the sword, with the famine and the pestilence, until I have consumed them by his hands. And then um, verse 10 For they prophesy a lie to you, to remove you far from your land, and I will drive you out, and you will perish. But the nations that bring their necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will let them remain in their own land, says the Lord, and they shall till it and dwell in it. I also spoke to Zedekiah king of Judah according to all these words, saying, Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon, and serve him and his people, and live. We submit to his yoke and accept the task he gives us 
to bless those around us. We are not carrying his yoke. We are just yoked to him because his yoke is easy and his burden is light, as it said in Matthew 11.30. The second imperative, learn from me, reiterates this concept. In Greek, The verb learn is connected to the term disciple. When we learn from Jesus, we are truly his disciples. Obedience and commitment are characteristics of discipleship. Question, what is the difference between being heavy laden in verse 28 and taking up his yoke in verse 29 of Matthew 11? Matthew eleven twenty eight and 29. Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The yoke was a common metaphor in Judaism for the law. Acts 15.10 uses it in reference to the law of circumcision. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Galatians 5 verse 1 contrasts the liberty Jesus offers with the yoke of bondage, which is a reference to the law as a means of salvation. Galatians 5.1 Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Being yoked to Jesus emphasises obedience and commitment to follow in his footsteps and to participate in his mission. While we cannot hope to add anything to the salvation that Jesus won for us on the cross, we can become his ambassadors and share the good news with those around us. Jesus' interpretation of the law, as demonstrated in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7, is even more radical than the Pharisees take on it. It requires heart surgery and transforms our motives. And his yoke is easy, and his burden is light, as we have already read in Matthew 11, verse 30. And so to finish the day, what a wonderful promise. Rest for your souls. How have you experienced that rest? What is it like? By focusing on Jesus and on what he offers us, how can we begin to know that rest? Tuesday, July 27. I am gentle and lowly in heart. Gentleness is an underrated quality today. Humility is laughed at. Social media has taught us to pay attention to the loud, the noisy, the weird and the wild and the flamboyant. Truly, so many of the world's standards are the opposite of what God deems important and valuable. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 59, we read... A knowledge of the truth depends not so much upon the strength of intellect as upon pureness of purpose, the simplicity of an earnest, dependent faith. To those who, in humility of heart, seek for divine guidance, angels of God draw near. The Holy Spirit is given to open to them the rich treasures of the truth. End of quote. Question, read Matthew 5.5, 5, 1 Peter 3.4 and Isaiah 57.15. How would you define meekness and humility based on these texts? Matthew 5.5, 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 1 Peter 3.4, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. And Isaiah 57.15, for thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. 
Paul refers to the meekness and gentleness of Christ in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent am bold toward you. Meekness and humility are not descriptions of pushovers, of people who cannot stand their own ground. Jesus himself did not seek confrontation and often avoided it because his mission had not yet been fulfilled, as we read in John 4, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptised more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptise but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. When confrontation came to him, however, he responded boldly, yet at the same time he spoke kindly. His laments over Jerusalem, just prior to the cross, for example, were not shouted curses, but tear-filled word pictures of a devastating future. We read that in Luke 19, verses 41 to 44. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your sure day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. In the New Testament, Jesus is often portrayed as the second Moses. He speaks from a mountain where he lays out the principles of his kingdom in Matthew 5, 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. He provides large crowds with miracle food. And we read that in Matthew 14, verses 13 to 21. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot. From the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, Bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Numbers 12.3 describes Moses as meek, which is echoed in Matthew 11.29. Numbers 12.3, now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. And Matthew 11.29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. People witnessing the feeding of the 5,000 exclaim in wonder, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world, John 6.14, a reference to Deuteronomy 18.15 and Moses' role as a prophet. And Deuteronomy 18.15 reads, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall here. Jesus' humility and meekness clearly supersede Moses. After all, he is our divine saviour. While Moses offered to give himself to save his people in Exodus 32.32, yet now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray blot me out of your book which you have written, his death would not have accomplished anything, for Moses was a sinner himself and in need of a saviour, a sin-bearer to pay for his sins. 
Though we can learn from Moses and the story of his life, we cannot find salvation in him. Instead, we need a saviour who can stand in our stead, not just as an intercessor, but as our substitute. Intercession is important, but it is only God hanging on the cross as our sin-bearer, as the one who paid in himself the penalty for our sin, who can save us from the legal consequences that our sin would justly bring on us. This is why, however great the example Jesus was for us, it would all be for nothing without the cross and the resurrection. Wednesday, July 28, for my yoke is easy. We already notice that Matthew's use of yoke in this section echoes Judaism's use of the term and those of other New Testament texts referring to a wrong understanding of the law. The Greek term translated as easy in Matthew 11.30 in the New King James Version also can be translated as good, pleasant, useful and benevolent. Many people around us consider God's law heavy-handed, difficult to comply with, and at times irrelevant. How can we help them to discover the beauty of the law and inspire love for the lawgiver? Matthew 11.30 reads, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Parents always remember the moment their child took that first step. A wobbly first step is followed by a tentative second step, then a third, and by then it's most likely that the child will stumble and fall. There may be tears and perhaps even a bruise, but once the child has felt the freedom of movement, he or she will get up and try again. Walk, fall, get up, walk, fall, get up. The sequence repeats itself many times before the child can walk securely, and yet, amid stumbles and falls, there is a proud little face triumphantly declaring, Papa, Mama, I can walk. Walking with Jesus may not always be easy, but it's always good, and the right thing to do. We may stumble, we may even fall, yet we can get up and continue to walk with Him at our side. In Galatians 5 verse 1, Paul wrote, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. What does that mean? How has Christ made us free? What is the difference between the yoke he asks us to carry and the yoke of bondage that Paul warns us against? We can be sure that whatever exactly Paul meant by the yoke of bondage, he was not referring to obedience to God's law, the Ten Commandments. On the contrary, it's through obedience, by faith, understanding that our salvation is secure, not based on the law, but on Christ's righteousness covering us, that we can have true rest and freedom. And so to finish the day, Why is living a life of obedience to God's law one of more restfulness than one in which we disobey that law? Thursday, July 29, My Burden is Light Jesus' final statement in Matthew 11.30 uses the imagery of bearing a burden, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Moses was delighted to see his father-in-law Jethro after Israel had left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. Read Exodus 18:13-22. What does bearing another person's burden look like in this story? Exodus 18 beginning at verse 13, and so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, What is this thing that you are doing for the people? 
Why do you alone sit, and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have had a difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his law. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, The things that you do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out, for this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel, and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people, so that you may bring the difficulties to God, and you shall teach them the statutes and the laws, and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. Exodus 18.13 tells us that people came to Moses for judgments from morning to evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw this, he earnestly pleaded with his son-in-law to establish a structure that would allow him to focus on the big things while trusting others to take care of the more mundane things. Scripture tells us that Moses listened to Jethro's voice and implemented these life-giving changes. When Jesus told us that his burden is light, he wanted to remind us that we can rely on him, the ultimate burden bearer. Like Moses, we must learn that we need others to share our burdens. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 26, Paul's imagery of the body of Christ offers a good illustration of what shared burdens may look like. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, am I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member... Where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have not need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, on these we bestow great honour, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honour to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honoured, all the members rejoice with it. We need a functioning body to be able to carry any weight. We need arms, legs, shoulders, muscles and sinews to carry anything. Read Galatians 6 too. How does bearing one another's burdens help us fulfil the law of Christ? Galatians 6.2 Bear one another's burdens and so fulfil the law of Christ. The immediate context of this passage may offer some help. In Galatians 6.1, Paul states that if a brother or sister falls into temptation, we are to restore that person in a spirit of gentleness. Remember Jesus' claim in Matthew 11.29 that he is gentle. Burden bearing means restoring someone who has gone off the track in order to help that person see divine grace. 
But it also means helping one another when we, or they, suffer hardship. The Greek term for burden can refer to a heavy weight or stone. It's a reminder that we all carry burdens and that we are all need those who can help us carry the burdens. Burden sharing is a divinely ordained church activity requiring gentleness and producing compassion. And so to finish today, think about the last time someone helped you carry a burden that you were struggling under. Why did that mean so much to you? Whose burden can you help carry now? Friday, July 30. From the book Child Guidance, page 267, we read, When you find your work hard, when you complain of difficulties and trials, when you say that you have no strength to withstand temptation, that you cannot overcome impatience, and that the Christian life is uphill work, be sure that you are not bearing the yoke of Christ. You are bearing the yoke of another master. End of quote. And from the same author, Faith and Works, pages 38 and 39, there is need of constant watchfulness and of earnest loving devotion, but these will come naturally when the soul is kept by the power of God through faith. We can do nothing, absolutely nothing, to commend ourselves to divine favour. We must not trust at all to ourselves or to our good works. But when, as erring sinful beings, we come to Christ, we must find rest in his love. God will accept everyone that comes to him trusting wholly in the merits of a crucified Saviour. Love springs up in the heart. There may be no ecstasy of feeling, but there is an abiding peaceful trust. Every burden is light, for the yoke which Christ imposes is easy. Duty becomes a delight and sacrifice a pleasure. The path that before seemed shrouded in darkness becomes bright with beams from the sun of righteousness. This is walking in the light as Christ is in the light. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Do you remember the moment in your walk with Jesus when you finally surrendered? Share this moment in your class and focus particularly on the reason you surrendered. 2. Study Jesus' prayer in Matthew 11:25 to 27 and discuss in your class how we gain knowledge of grace. Why does God hide the plan of salvation, these things, from the wise and prudent and reveal them to babes? Matthew 11:25 to 27 At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. 3. In a practical way, how can we help those around us struggling with their burdens to come to Jesus and find rest? And four, dwell more on this idea of being meek and lowly in heart. Isn't that bad for a person's self-esteem? Shouldn't we feel good about ourselves, especially people who struggle with self-doubts anyway? How should the cross and what the cross represents help us to understand what Jesus means about being meek and lowly? That is, in the presence of the cross, why are meekness and lowliness the only real appropriate attitudes to have? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Praying Without Ceasing, and it's by Andrew McChesney. Ning Tsing's two daughters wanted to go to the Seventh day Adventist school when they arrived in the United States as refugees from Myanmar. 
Eight-year-old Lun made it a matter of prayer during morning and evening family worship. Please, God, help us, she prayed. We want to go to an Adventist school. If you want, you can help us. Nuam was only four and not ready for school, but that didn't deter her. Please, God, help us, she prayed. Then, single mother Ning wished she had a choice other than public school in their new hometown in the state of Georgia, but she didn't have money to send Lun to the Adventist school. She had other problems as well. She couldn't speak English. She didn't know how to drive. She had no job. Then the headache started. The pain spread to her left arm and left side. She lost sight in her left eye. Ning wept. How would she care for her daughters, much less send them to Adventist school? As she cried, she read the Bible and prayed, God, please answer my prayer, she said. Give me a miracle. Slowly the pain disappeared and her sight returned. A warehouse offered her work and an Adventist pastor drove her to the job interview. When she was hired, co-workers picked her up at the house and took her back. Then she learned how to drive. Her salary, however, was small. The first school year ended and Noam was old enough to start first grade in the fall. Both daughters kept praying. When the new school year started, both girls entered public school. Still, they kept praying. God, please help us, Lun prayed. Send kind rich people to pay the school fees. We want to learn the Bible in school. We want to know you. Three weeks into the school year, an Adventist friend called. Funds from a 13th Sabbath offering would help cover the girls' tuition at the Adventist school. Your girls can start next week, the friend said. Lun was ecstatic. Thank you, God, she exclaimed. You were able to do everything. You heard our prayers. We love you, God. We praise you. Noam began to cry. Oh, really? she said. God really answered our prayers? The sisters woke up early at 5.30am for their first day at school. They eagerly watched and waited at the window for the school bus to arrive. God is very great to my family and me, Ning said. He cares for us and loves us so much. And there's a photograph of Ning here at the side. Thank you for your 2011 13th Sabbath offering that helped Ning's daughters go to an Adventist school. This quarter's offering will again help refugee children get an Adventist education in the North American division. Thank you for planning a generous offering. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.